Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be reviewing the SV Boney SV48P. It's a 102mm f6.5 achromatic refractor optical tube assembly. Now if you think you've heard that model name before, well, you have. In fact, you might have seen it here. About a year ago, I bought a 90mm f5.5 version of this telescope on an impulse buy on Amazon because the price was just too good to pass up. It was $199. They have apparently retained the nomenclature for the 4-inch model. Now, I did purchase the 90mm model myself, but SV Boney contacted me afterwards and said, if you like the 90, you really do need to see the 4-inch version. So if you're new to the hobby, it may seem a little odd that there are two telescopes with such close aperture ranges, a 90 and a 100, but if you are a seasoned astronomer, especially a refractor lover, you know that subjectively the difference between 90 and 100 millimeters is a lot bigger than those numbers would indicate. And to take an extreme example, Takahashi, it's a high-end manufacturer, they manufacture a 60, a 76, a 90, a 102, and many more, and they have no trouble selling all of those, sometimes even all of those, to the same customer. Now the first sample they gave me was a pre-production sample. This model released in November of 2024, and I got one in October, about a month earlier. And when I got it, there was obviously something wrong with the optics. It just didn't look very good. They apologized and then sent me this one. This is one that is after it was released in November of 2024 and should be a lot more representative of what you, the customer, would buy when you see one of these things. So you know the, the 102 millimeter f6.5 specification is, I don't think that was done by accident. Those are very close to the numbers of an astrophysics traveler. Well, okay, nothing wrong with high aspirations. So SV Boney, of course, is the company determined to sell you everything that you need at ridiculously low prices. The retail list price on this optical tube assembly is $329, but it is routinely discounted. And at the time of filming, you can actually get it for $229 for all of this. Are bargains back? Let's take a look. Now, the only concession you're going to see to price on this entire product is the lens cap. It's made of plastic. Well, okay, at this price point, we can forgive this. Now, this does screw off, but it's a little bit unusual. Now, in most cases, it would be just the dew shield that comes off, but this pulls the entire mirror cell with it, and there are no adjustments or collimation screws of any kind, so whatever collimation or alignment comes out of the factory, you've just got to live with it. You've also got some knife edge baffles inside. Nice touch at this price point. So if you saw my review of the 90 millimeter, you know that the main concern that I had, and some of you had them too, was this focuser. The focuser was loose in mine and I had to get it adjusted. And judging by the reviews and people who have written to me, you, a lot of you had this problem too. This was the first thing I checked as soon as I pulled it out of the box. And I'm pleased to report this is just fine. This is very well made. There's a two-speed focuser. The draw tube has gradations on it so you can find your place. And if you look on the bottom, it does a really good imitation of a feather touch. Look at that. Cosmetically, very, very similar to a feather touch focuser with a rack and pinion mechanism here and lots of adjustments for you to play with. Now, unlike the feather touch, which feels like you're not moving anything at all, this is actually the opposite. There's a lot of resistance here, and it's even a little bit grainy and grindy. Some people actually refer, re prefer that because they like to feel that they're actually moving against something. But in either case, it's fine because it's really well made, and I don't think you're going to have any trouble drawing fine focus on this thing. Standard finder shoe here, and if you notice on the 90 millimeter that I reviewed, the rings, which are still referred to as metal hoops, by the way, in the marketing literature, the 90 was a little bit of an unusual arrangement because the thing only 
loosened at two spots here. So if you wanted to take the rings and the plate off, you had to take off the visual back and then the whole thing had to come out. It was a really bit of an unusual situation, but this is more conventional. The rings do come off with these four hex head screws here. There are mounting points at the top here. And those of you who know refractors, this is very similar to the arrangement of an astrophysics traveler or stowaway. That's the kind of ring system that they use. Well, it's okay if you're paying homage to those telescopes. So overall, I don't know how much of this is coming across on video, but this is extremely well made, not just for the price. It is well made, period set up the way this one you see set up with a red dot reflex sight, a generic two inch diagonal and a 20 to eight millimeter Orion deep view eyepiece, the optical tube grows to about 10 pounds, still a reasonable load. Now this telescope did spend time atop many of my mounts, including the Vixen Porta, one of my AVXs, but I thought, you know what? Let's just keep it in the family. <laughs> this is an SV Boney SV225 mount head that I bought. Several of you have recommended this to me and I thought I'd just try one out. Now I do have a lot of things to say about this mount head, but I'll say them in a separate review because there's a little bit to talk about here. You do have to get this mount head on a tripod of suitable strength so because I have an extra set of AVX legs, I modified the M10 center bolt to take a 3 8 inch bolt here, which bolts into the bottom of the mount head. And as you can see, it works quite well. And you do have slow motion controls here. So, you know, out here, it's really good. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing much to talk about. I have a friend who says, any competently made telescope sells itself in the winter time. Is that true? Well, it might be. Out in the winter time here, as long as the telescope doesn't have any obvious imperfections, things tend to work out pretty well. You can look at many of the showpiece objects and spend an entire evening doing this. I saw the Orion Nebula, many of the open clusters in Auriga, including M37, M36, and M38, M35 in Gemini, and the Pleiades and the Andromeda galaxies setting towards the west. With this eyepiece, I was able to pick out M33 in Triangulum, a notoriously difficult object for beginners, but you know what? You got a good refractor, the contrast is much better, and you can make that out. Now, SV Boney does sell this thing as an astrophotography tool. I think they may be overselling that just a little bit. I think if, if it were me, I would recommend this telescope to budding astrophotographers mainly as a learning tool, but you can do both webcam lunar planetary and you can do some deep sky. So I have out here several nights and I had a setup similar to the one that you're seeing. This is my ZWO ASI 120MM. I have several of these. That is the Dash S variant that you see in the photograph. And you know, typically acromats do not perform well on this type of imaging. This one isn't an exception, but if you look at the moon image that I have here, you know what? That's not bad. I think that's pretty good. Now on deep sky, things get a little bit more complicated. I have to keep saying this to beginners, yes, the optical tube does not cost very much, but by the time you put everything around it to get it to do astrophotography, the all-important mount, the camera, that is my Hutech modded EOS 5D, the auto guider, and then all the software you need to do to process all of this, I had to surround this $250 or so optical tube with three to $4,000 worth of equipment just to get it to take some images. I used the Teleview field flattener, which I happen to have on hand, and I I took some of these images and as you can see by the variety of targets here, I had this telescope for a very long time. There are fall objects like the Crescent Nebula and the Pac-Man, that's NGC 281. There is the Andromeda Galaxy. Now as you can see, this is a typical acromat. You are going to see those blue halos around stars. That is normal. And if you notice on these images, you know, the, the fewer stars there are, the fewer bright stars you see on the images, the easier it is to hide that. And I'll show the opposite here. This image of the Orion Nebula, I think is pretty darn good. And this image of the horse head also, I think is quite good. You'll see some blue halos here. Now, yes, you can mask that off in Photoshop or in PixInsight if you know what you're doing and get rid of those. But as this is more of a beginner's telescope, we're just gonna leave those as you see them. So overall here, we're looking at a pretty decent telescope, especially for this price. You can do low power sweeping with a low power eyepiece like this one. 
on planets and on the moon, I found I could go up to 125 to 150 power with no problem, and I probably could have gone higher if I wanted to. The mount starts to get a little jittery somewhere around that range. You know, normally when I do these reviews, I've usually seen several samples of whatever it is I happen to be reviewing, and I can tell you trends, and I can tell you if a particular sample is a stray data point in one way or another. In the case of this manufacturer, I have not seen very many of their products, so if you buy one of these, please post your comments and your experiences below so that we can all see them. Also, if you are a beginner, please keep in mind the purchase of an optical tube is just the start of your journey and potentially the start of you spending a lot of money as well. By the time you add the finder, the diagonal, the eyepieces, and the all-important mount, you could wind up spending several hundred to potentially several thousands of dollars to get a fully functioning rig working. With those two caveats in mind, I can't find anything wrong here. In fact, this is much better than I expected, especially at its price point. So whether you're a seasoned astronomer looking for a second telescope, whether you're a beginner looking to get started, if you're looking for a star party telescope, or if you're a budding astrophotographer trying to learn the ropes, I think this would be a good buy for you. You know, I've often said, the best reviews are often the short ones. Not always, but very often. I have very little to say here, and that's a good thing in this case. Is the bargain back? Well, it just may be. Let's hope this trend continues. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.